Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections, and today we're going to talk to Shackley Raffetto. Shackley is an old friend of mine and an old friend of Think Tech. Uh, Shackley uh, is a retired chief judge of the Second Circuit, a lawyer, a judge, a world traveler, uh, and a guy who has studied the context and condition of humanity in many, many places. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show, Shackley. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. I'm very happy to be here. Our title today is, uh, can the, CC, the CCP, Communist Party of China, can the CCP survive corona coronavirus? Which is a real question and every day that goes by. It seems like that question is more pertinent. Uh, so let's, let's talk about context. Um, mm -hmm. You know, China comes from a different place than the U.S. Uh, China has made extraordinary strides, but we still have to understand the essential China. Can you, can you give us your thoughts about what that is? Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, ancient civilization. Uh, the one thing people do tend to forget, though, is that uh, uh, some of those uh, dynasties uh, of China were not actually the Han Chinese. You know, the last dynasty, the Qing dynasty, were the, uh, were the Manchurians. And that, that lasted for a long time, several hundred years. And then the Mongolians, I forget, they were, I think they called that Yuan dynasty. Uh, in Kublai Khan and and uh, and those people from the north, so real real China, I think, was the 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 uh, area between the two great rivers, right? The, like the Yangtze and the Yellow River, I think, is what is considered historically Han China, and then it is you know expanded, and now of course the claims are include the Nine Dash Line and the South China Sea and Tibet and uh, you know. Uh, Xinjiang, which we all know about yeah, now. Yeah, we know that now. <clears throat> now, now, put on top of all of that, communism, and the Chinese version of communism, and the Chinese version of the relationship of the citizen and the state. Uh, this is a hard question, too, if you don't mind. Uh, what well, what I, is the state of that? Well, you know, I've been to China a lot, and uh, you, it's not, you don't get into political discussions. Uh, I haven't with with uh, my Chinese friends, uh, and I think that they do the same thing that the former East Germans did. I have a very good friend who was grew up in East Germany, and I asked her once, "How, how did you deal with it with this communist, um, you know, intrusiveness into your life?" And she said, "We just ignored it, you know. As, as we stayed away from those people as much as possible, and we went about our daily life and." you know, earned our living and lived our lives. And and uh, we had a lot of red tape if we wanted to travel someplace. Uh, that doesn't seem so much anymore in China because there's lots of Chinese travelers. Um, I think there was, uh, before we stopped the flights from China, I think there was, a, it was China Eastern and another China Airlines and Hawaiian, which eventually stopped uh, flying to Beijing. And, uh, uh, and I've, I've flown on the Chinese flights and they're always packed. Yeah. So Chinese people are traveling all over the world now. And it's so been, it's been so, a, a, a kind of arc, hasn't it? I mean, uh, you know, back in the 90s, uh, um, you know, they were sort of winding up for global expansion, winding up for what I would say was enlightenment, capitalist enlightenment. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And they realized that I mean, back in the early 2000s, uh, you know, you went to China and you, you saw, you felt, you were encouraged by this kind of enlightenment. But it sounds to me anyway, and I would be interested in your thoughts on this, is that somewhere along the line that, that reached, a, you know, reached an arc. And now it's changed. Xi Jinping has changed it. And we have a yeah. different kind. The enlightenment that we saw, that we loved about China 15 years ago, is not the same, is it? No, I agree. The, the, remember when Xi Jinping came into office, um, I was under the impression that he was a lawyer, and there was a lot of discussion that it might uh, he, he might be the one who really um, liberalizes uh, China and, and and adopts more democratic ways. And of course, it's gone just the opposite uh, that we expected. And uh, um, well, you know, it sounded like he was doing uh, an anti-corruption at first. It sounded like uh, you know maybe. Uh, uh, it became a, a sheep in wolf's, a rather a wolf in sheep's clothing. And then, you know, you began to get the idea that maybe it wasn't just anti-corruption. Anti he was looking to aggrandize his own power. 
And step by step, uh, you know, that possibility was, was confirmed by his actions. I mean, for example, becoming what amounts to president for life, being written into the Chinese constitution, being compared to Mao Zedong. Um, he's trying to be Mao. And, uh, promoting, this, yeah. promoting Xi Jinping thought, yeah. like uh, Chairman Mao did with the little red book. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I understand from things that I see on the, on the internet, uh, although I didn't notice it too much when I was there, the, uh, 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 a lot of, I guess there have been big changes in the educational system to promote, uh, you know, support for Marxist-Leninist thinking. Uh, I don't know quite how that fits into the Chinese culture, but uh, uh, yeah. but the, but that's the effort now. And of course, they they had the great firewall, so they control all the information that comes through. Although I get the impression quite a few Chinese people, especially young people, uh, have these VPNs that they can use to breach the firewall. Uh, Which are illegal. Time, right? Yeah, yeah, it's against the law to use one, so you you do it at your own risk. But they they seem to allow it because uh, when they have party congresses and so on, they they tighten that up, as I understand it, and uh, and you you can't uh, get outside information. But That's then, a... but then the overseas the overseas Chinese news outlets that I now I think have to register as agents of foreign governments, um, uh, they they put things up on YouTube. <laughs> they they try to control social media, which we're yeah. seeing now today, even in, in these difficult times, maybe especially. In, but, you know, you talked about somebody who, uh, you know, took it, um, you know, not so seriously uh, back a few years ago, who, you know, could kind of blow off some of the, uh, the dark side of, of communist rule in China. Um, I think that's changed, too, hasn't it? You can't blow it off anymore. You want to blow it off, not take it seriously, you know, you... You could find yourself uh, in, a, in, a, in a retraining camp or worse, no? Or as a foreigner, you could be detained. Yeah, that means put in jail. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Yeah, rather unpleasant circumstances, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, so all this enlightenment has become like mm, skin deep. And uh, his uh, uh, purported uh, attempt to control uh, corruption has turned into a huge big power trip uh, by a guy who is a, essentially a dictator. And, uh, and the people are suffering. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a sad situation where you thought it was enlightenment, but then you find that it's not really enlightenment at all. And it's pretty scary. Uh, you know, I, for one, uh, you know, I've been there three times and I, I don't think I'm going back because I don't like the way this has turned. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel that enlightenment anymore. I, I enjoyed it when I was there, but I, I don't think I'd enjoy walking around looking over my shoulder all day in China. Well, I, I, and also, uh, you know, with the coronavirus, I think it's going to be a long time before there's a resurgence of foreign uh, tourist travel, at least, into China. I'm sure there'll still be business travel, but, you know, the people like Gordon Chang, for instance, are predicting that that because of the, the, the threat to the uh, chain of distribution of goods that are manufactured in China, uh, by the conduct of the Communist Party and not not telling people about this virus when they knew about it and actually s as apparently sending delegations um, uh, overseas, government delegations. I guess the people who signed phase one uh, were, in the, were in the White House, this is according to Gordon Chang, uh, after they already knew that there was an outbreak of this uh, coronavirus in uh, Wuhan. I never and said so a word. Yeah, yeah, they never said a word, and and uh, I guess that goes back to uh, the structure of the system, where where the local the local um, uh, people in charge don't want to present bad news up the up the up the party line unless they're authorized from above to do that. Mm -hmm. where, it's, mm -hmm. where it's in a freer society, people just start speaking, and then there's that case of that one young Chinese doctor who did talk. And then it eventually died and was censured, taken down to the police department, made to sign some sort of agreement that, I guess, a non-disclosure agreement. And, uh, and then re recently I, I heard that his, his supervising physician died of coronavirus. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's really spread. It's, it's really remarkable. And, you know, you, you do have to wonder why it seems so virulent 
Um, gee, virulent, that's a word right off virus, isn't it? Uh, so virulent in China, you know, that it's it spread so quickly, it spread so drastically, uh, surreptitiously sometimes, and, and why people dying at such a high rate. Um, it's all over China, and, as you know, compared to anywhere else, even when, you know, you find like in Italy or in Iran, it's going fast. It's going way faster in China. And, th and that brings us to this whole issue about, uh, you know, how Mao has done in terms of being transparent and candid and helpful and informative to his own people uh, from the start. Because, you know, you know, it's a control situation. And in China, uh, CCP controls information, as you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so you have to assume that he controlled or stopped the flow of information about this from early on. Uh, why would he do that? And did he think he's going to get away with that? Well, it's all about control, as I understand it. You know, they... They don't want to do any. They don't want to let anything happen that is might threaten the control of the party, and that's more important than anything. And that's why you know they postponed the. Um, I forget the meeting of the Politburo is it that, that was supposed to be scheduled? Uh, I think in April. Uh, they completely have postponed that, uh, obviously to protect themselves. And. Uh, yeah, I think it's fair to say that people in China, in general, government and non-government, are terrified. Um, you know, this whole lockdown of millions, yeah. tens of millions of people, this, this idea that you can't even go out of your house, and if you do, you're in trouble, and you'll, you'll be arrested, and terrible things will happen to you. This thing about uh, how do you get food, you send out a delegated person in certain hours, and he has to have a, a certain pass, and the database registers him, and he's uh, surveilled just like they do in uh, what, Xin, Xinjiang, at the Uyghurs. I mean, all yeah. that technology is coming into play, and it's controlling, you know, not only the, the thoughts of people, but their, their every movement, their every moment. Um, this is really, you know, he said when he was mm, building that surveillance system in was it Xinjiang, um, right. when he was building that system, he says, well, you know, we're, we're doing this, uh, we're overdoing it because we want to see if it works. And if it, if it works, we'll, we'll deliver it all over China. So this is his opportunity in a left-handed you know, way um, to, to test out that system countrywide. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he has uh, one, a big chance now. <laughs> one, com one commentator I saw said, uh, said, well, you know, there was about 5 million people who left Wuhan uh, for, for, the, for the annual uh, vacation. And uh, he said, uh, you know, if they have all this ability to track people down, why haven't they tracked this 5 million people down? And tested him, right, and then done done things. Uh, so I, you know, I don't think they were paying much attention to the World Health Organization, at least not at the outset, and and only politically later. Um, and so, uh, you know, I guess the question I put to you not not that either of us is a medical expert or a quarantine expert. Did they do it right, did, or did they make mistakes in the way they handled the original uh, outbreak? The World Health Organization. No, China. Oh, uh, well, I, I mean, it seems like they should have t told people, you know, I mean, the, the, as I understand it, the way to stop these kind of uh, uh, viruses from spreading is to is to quarantine and contain it. Um, and they didn't do that. And now and people have traveled from China all over the world. And, you know, now now we've got uh, almost 100,000 cases worldwide. <clears throat> Amazing. And the, the, I just saw something from uh, an interview with a Harvard professor uh, who is, has expertise in the field, and he said that his they use these mathematical models, and he said that from forty to seventy percent of the world's population will probably be infected, according to their models. Now it doesn't mean everybody's going to die, but he said that those who are at risk, the older people with health complications. Um, uh, uh, run the uh, risk of, of dying, and that a lot—that's going to be a lot of people, according yes. to their models. It's going to be culling, and, the, culling the herd, so to speak. Yeah, and I also saw, saw something uh, earlier today that indicated that there might be two strains of this. Mm. Uh, one, one is more serious than the other, mm. and that a person can actually catch both, or one after the other. Yeah, there's so much we don't know about it, um, and. Um, you know, I, I'd like to think that the medical community, the global medical community, can get a handle on some of these things. But I, 
I do not, I do not have the feeling. For example, uh, you mentioned two strains. Well, how do you get two strains? You have one uh, mutate into a second one, um, and it just happens to be of different characteristics. Well, Shackley, if one can mutate into a second one, why can't the second one mutate into a third one, and so yes. forth? And you know, you can solve number one and number two, but can you solve number three? So this is the kind of virus that's really deadly on a global scale. And I don't know if uh, any, any researcher in China understood that, but let's examine, and I don't know the facts too well on this, but let's examine. There was a laboratory. I'm not sure if the laboratory was in Wuhan or Shanghai. No, and it was, was doing- Wu Yeah, the level four uh, bi biological laboratory. Yeah. yeah that's, that was in Wuhan. About what 15, I think 15 kilometers from the wet market that was first uh, talked about. What happened there? Well, we don't know. Uh, uh, it was it, apparently the French are very good at building these things. They built one in Canada and uh, and then they uh, arranged to cooperate with the Chinese to build theirs in uh, in Wuhan. And the story I heard is that uh, they offered the French offered to construct it. Um, on the basis of their expertise and the Chinese government said, no, we have our own people construct it. And uh, allegedly there's a lot of corruption in the construction industry there. So who knows what could have happened? I've, I've heard other kind of wild theories. Yeah, too, yeah. But... It's, not, it's not clear. And, and I saw one thing no. in the paper this morning that suggested that an American, uh, an American researcher debunked the thought uh, that that the that the virus actually came from one of the Chinese laboratories. Suffice to say, there's um, a bit of a discussion now about who is responsible for it, whether it's China or the U.S., because uh, Xi Jinping has seen fit to <laughs> adopt and proliferate con conspiracy theories, saying, "Ah, it's really the Americans; they're responsible for this." Don't you love how the pot calls the kettle black? Have yeah, you yeah, followed right. that? No, oh, it's just great, great disinformation program. Yeah. <laughs> pretty soon, we'll, pretty soon we'll have a bunch of people believing it here. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen plenty of that. So yeah. you know, it's interesting that it seems to be a uh, full-on, full-tilt, uh, you know, disinformation program against the U.S. now, and it's yeah. organized by the government of China, and it's everywhere in the propaganda organs of China. And furthermore, they are putting it on, the Chinese are putting it on, um, on social media. So it has a, it has a world, world flow that yeah. way. And, yeah. and I guess you're right, some people are going to believe that. <laughs> well, one wonders what, what effect it's going to have on the phase one trade agreement. Right. And, on, yeah. and, and, this, and this goes to the point. And on the relationship between China and the U.S., the article that we've shared on the subject uh, came out today. Um, and the suggestion was this was not going to help the U.S. trade relationship uh, or relationship in general, the diplomatic relationship, such as it is a little tarnished these days between, uh, you know, China and, and the U.S. Um, but, the, but the operative question for us is how does this affect this disinformation campaign, uh, which assumes that, you know, China is really embarrassed. China made some horrendous mistakes here. China didn't reveal this, not to its own people, not to the world. And China is, you know, here it is. I'm telling you something you already know. China is largely, if not exclusively, responsible for releasing this uh, in, into the community. So mm -hmm. the question is, how are the Chinese people going to deal with this? And the context is, the Chinese people have accepted Xi Jinping and previous rulers because, because they gave them a good economy. That's in and good health, I suppose, and improving mm -hmm. health. So, but now those things are in serious jeopardy. Uh, the uh, Chinese people are terrified. Uh, they worry about their families, which are important to them. Um, and, and so the, the CCP really depends on the goodwill of the people. Always been the case in China. Uh, can it survive? Well, you forgot the PLA. They also have the People's Liberation Army, which is the army of the Communist Party of China. It's not the National Army of China. And they, and it seems to me, I think, as long as that uh, organization stays loyal to the party, um, not much is, can really change because they just have too much power. And over the years, when I've had an opportunity to talk to people in China about whether, first up, I, I asked, is there a government 
or is the Chinese Communist Party the government? And they said, no, we have a we have a government and we have a constitution. It's just that over the top of all of that, the Communist Party runs everything. And uh, uh, and I said, well, you know, is it possible then that uh, you could get rid of the Communist Party, the government could run the country and, you know, you could have a change of uh, of um, government policy without violence. And uh, everybody I talked to said, no, not not without violence, and that was, which is very sad. Yeah, well, that's been the history in China. If you're not happy with the government because of the economy or anything else, you turn the government over, but it doesn't go over without violence. It's happened yeah. many times in the, in the historical, um, you know, the book of history of China. But, so the question is, uh, will the PLA stay loyal and faithful? Because, <clears throat> this is something very provocative, because the PLA is not exempt from coronavirus. And the That's PLA right. lives in, in close quarters. Uh, if one fellow in the barracks uh, develops the coronavirus, uh, then maybe others. And before you know it, you have an unpredictable situation, no? Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, I understand that there, there have some cases in the prison system in China, which would be a similar situation of uh, barracks living, I guess you might call it. Uh, what I'm kind of more interested in is the long, long-term knock-on effects of the virus on the trade deal. You know, is that going to go through? Uh, and and what what uh, opportunities are there for a phase two, which they've talked about? Nobody, you notice, nobody's talking about a phase two trade agreement at the moment. Yeah, and, and they, uh, they probably aren't going to talk about it until this thing somehow resolves. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's true. And and in the meantime. Um, I think American companies are going, to, are going to relocate. Where to? You know, China has been the manufacturing center of, for America and for yeah. much of the world. Uh, how do you relocate your your uh, your, your supply line? Uh, where can you get the same man manufacturing capability? Um, it doesn't sound too easy for an American company. Pro probably not easy, but if you look, if they're looking at the long run, I mean. Be better to have it in nor in uh, North America or South America, you know, at least in our hemisphere. Although there's there's lots and lots of other people living in other countries in Asia, Indonesia, for instance, and and uh, well, even Vietnam. Uh, but notice Vietnam closed their borders uh, yeah. pretty quickly. Yeah, China's uh, influence on the on One Belt One Road initiative, the Belt and Road Initiative, that's got to change. I I suggest I'm interested in your thoughts. Uh, that that could stop the Belt Road Initiative in its tracks, no? Seems to me, yeah. I, I understand there's a million Chinese in uh, uh, working on these various projects in in, in Africa, um, and uh, surely there's going to be an outbreak of coronavirus there. And they're and they're, from what I understand, they're they're woefully unprepared in their public health systems in the various Africa. You know, I've been to West Africa several of the countries in West Africa, and they're, they're pretty third world. And uh, if, they, if they had a huge uh, outbreak of something like this, uh, yeah. on, top of, on top of Ebola, you know, and the other things that, that have, have uh, caused problems there. Regardless of the propaganda campaign that Xi Jinping is undertaking, uh, if, if there's a breakout in Africa, uh, people are going to naturally I don't know how they can, can be convinced otherwise. They're going to naturally blame China. Uh, and that's going to change the relationship of a lot of countries and projects with China. Yeah. So I think, I think we see, you know, this was point of discussion with uh, my show with Carl Baker, uh, uh, formerly of the APCSS and the Pacific Forum. Um, you know, the, 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 there'll be geopolitical changes outside in the relations of China and other countries, including maybe especially including the U.S., but what about what about inside? I mean, people in China are terrified. People in China must be very, what do you want to say, disappointed, if you will, with the lack of protection they're getting, the lack of candor they're getting from the government. Um, how, how, if at all, you know, uh, can the government fix that? How, if at all, can, can that be repaired to the way it was? Or will it be different? I mean, forgetting, you know, forgetting a, an upheaval, will it be different going forward? Will the whole... Mm, the whole mm, mechanism in China, the governmental relationship in China, changed because of this, and if so, how? Uh, it seems to me that that 
more important or equally important with the coronavirus situation is the financial situation in China. Mm, right. Uh, the level of debt and the things that people like Kyle Bass talk about, the hedge fund uh, guy. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it, it, I would think if there's going to be change, it will be because the Communist Party fails to deliver on prosperity and or the prosperity that has been created to the hard work of the Chinese people just collapses because of their mismanagement of things like the coronavirus and the financial condition of the country. I, Gordon Chang said today that the, China is importing 20 percent less oil than it, than it uh, ha has in the last couple of years, year on year, and that the economy itself is stagnating that about a th only about a third of the workforce has gone back to work, even though they've been they're, they've been encouraged by the government to go back to work uh, in spite of the of the virus. Mm -hmm. and of course, of course, most people don't believe their figures anyway. They think that that they're that they're way understating everything by uh, at least times ten. Yeah. So they, if they that, decided if that's true. Yeah. If that's true. Then you may you may have this financial collapse. I mean. Uh, Bass makes the point that they can they can continue to to print yuan or RMB <clears throat> internally, but they still need dollars to uh, to um, conduct their foreign trade, buy oil and things like that. And uh, and the less business they have with the, with the rest of the world to acquire do dollars or euros, maybe um, the uh, the more likely it is that the that the economy will collapse eventually. Well, you know, the, the, the magic word is change and flexibility. You can't be brittle. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, the communist uh, line is, uh, is one of brittleness, uh, where you don't listen to people and you just keep on doing what you were doing before. And it leads to my last question for you, Shackley. We only have a minute left. <laughs> okay. I would like to make you the counselor for Xi Jinping. I'd like <laughs> him to have your ear. Okay, it's this crisis moment in China, and for that matter, the world as the world is being infected with the coronavirus. What is your advice to him on how to save China, save the relationship with the government and the people, you know, and save the mm, the image of China for for the global perspective? I I think he would have to uh, do, do some sort of apology uh, for the manner that it's been handled, as well as talk about how it's you know uh, uh, various successes in handling it and. Uh, and uh, do and maybe liberalize the press a little bit. People yeah. would probably receive that really well. Yeah, and stop throwing people in jail for talking about it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, it's you can only keep your head down from that sort of thing for so long, and then pretty soon it's somebody in your family that's been picked up. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then it can, it can, and it'll have knock-on effects. But. Uh, I've, taught, I've communicated with a couple of friends in China since this all started, and they, they're living in their apartments in Beijing, you know, and they don't go out, just as you described it. Yeah, it's all a matter of time. You can't do that for an indefinite period of time. And by the same token, we can't do this show for an indefinite period of time either. Uh, we're out of okay. time, Shackley. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you for a great discussion. Yeah, uh, thank you. Global Connection, Shackley Rufetto, thank you so much. Aloha. Okay, take care. Aloha.